We have our product designers, Jenny and Kian, and also our director of design, Noah, will be joining us today. Some topics that will be covered during this live stream will include how to work cross collaboratively in FigJam, how to collaborate with non-design teams and cross-functionally within FigJam, and then also talking about what are the different use cases that design managers can have um, when working within FigJam. Okay, so I think that's the end of our introduction. I would love to move it on to Jenny, who's going to share her screen and start presenting um, a little bit about how she and her team work together um, within FigJam to collaborate and brainstorm. Um, so I'm just gonna share my screen. There we go. Um, hi, um, before we dive in, just as a quick sort of like intro to FigJam, um, it's our new uh, whiteboard tool from Figma. Um, and it's basically a place where we've been doing a bunch of lower fidelity design work and collaboration. Um, in terms of like benefits that it's had for our team, it's helped us be more generative as a design team, helped us collaborate more smoothly with our non-design teammates. Um, and we've seen this both in like brainstorms as well as in diagramming together. Um, and I'm gonna have examples from both. Um, so as a designer, I feel like everyone's like, oh, do you like design Figma in Figma? Um, and today I'm going to be sharing examples of us designing FigJam uh, in FigJam. Um, so our, my, my first example is around generating ideas amongst other designers um, for helping one another to um, help resolve this like big open question. Um, and the second one will be more around like a specific um, interaction that we resolve together as a cross-functional team. Um, so this example specifically is around running a design workshop where we first came up with the idea to pursue some of our more fun features. Um, and what those features were, uh, were basically cursor chat, which today, if you hit slash, you can start typing and be like, hello. Um, and then other people in the file will see you start, will see you start chatting and typing. Um, the other one is emoji reactions, which you can access from here. Um, and basically start emoting like temporal reactions on the canvas, um, as well as stamping, um, which you can access from here also to basically vote with your face and sort of like dot vote and stamp on the canvas. Um, so for this example, um, we all know that like brainstorms, you basically just wanna generate as many ideas as possible. Um, it's not really about the quality or the fidelity of ideas. Um, and it's kind of like tricky to do when you're brainstorming remotely because everybody is like on the screen. And I think being on a computer, you just like wanna do stuff that's really high fidelity and start pulling in like design system components. Um, especially like us as a design team, since we're always in Figma, um, we've done these brainstorms before in Figma and there's just like a tendency to get really high fidelity and like to really polish ideas um, as opposed to like getting a lot of ideas out. Um, so we've noticed that when we've brought over brainstorms like this to FigJam, um, you're sort of just like limited by the toolbar at the bottom and these really sort of like rough, low fidelity um, objects that you can create things with um, so that way you're not getting into pixel perfect stuff. So specifically for this brainstorm, like I said, we were trying to think of ways to inject fun into the product. Um, and I wanted to emanate like this basically like working backwards technique um, that Amazon pioneered a while ago. Um, and if you haven't heard of it before, it's basically where you like write a press release um, and then you use that press release to like anchor on like the story that you'll eventually tell people when you release your product. Um, it's that way you don't like really get into the nitty gritties of like the features and the specific edge cases that you're solving for right away. Um, and you think about like what's what really matters to your customers. Um, so We've seen people in the past um, when they are really excited about Figma features, um, they'll tweet about it. Uh, people on the team will sort of share about it. And with these features, we basically wanted to invoke those like same feelings. Um, so what I did for this brainstorm was created some templates of basically a tweet and a Slack uh, message. Um, so I made those in Figma design um, and made them into components that have like auto layout built into them. So if you like type in here, they'll just like relay out really, really um, nicely. And then I took those and basically just copied and pasted them 
into my FigJam file. Um, and they basically work with the auto layout in FigJam too. Um, and setting up this exercise was good because it helped our team basically just like constrain ourselves to these specific um, formats. So here you can see people actually ideating on some of like the really early versions of cursor chat or of, um, of emoji reactions, which, you know, here it's, it sort of actually looks, looks and feels pretty similar to these um, sketches here. Um, and basically we all just went heads down for like 25 minutes um, and just used things like components and things like the pencil tool here um, to just like draw out ideas within these components. Um, and what that helped us do was just really not worry about the exact format of the ideas. Um, it really forced us to be like low fidelity because we had these tools and these templates already for how we were going to be ideating. Um, so yeah, it's just kind of fun to like pan around and look at some of these early sketches um, of how this idea came together. Um, and then similarly, we did something for cursor chat. Um, so here you can see some like really early ideas of cursor chat um, and just seeing them at this fidelity and thinking about how people reacted was really, really um, helpful because it got people excited around these ideas. Um, yeah. So then the second um, example that I'm going to share is around a different part of the design process, um, which is later on in the design process and less of like an ideation type brainstorm um, and more of us as like a small cross-functional team, um, myself or PM, as well as some engineers to get this like very specific um, interaction resolved. Um, so today with our sticky notes, you might notice if you use them and create a sticky note um, that by default, your name is at the bottom. Um, but, you know, you can also go into the toolbar here and there's this show slash hide author action and hide your name and have it show up again. Um, you'll notice that, you know, other people's sticky notes have their names on it and you can't change it um, because it's accredited to them. Um, and your sticky note color also is different for every different sticky note. Um, but uh, when we were first working on this, there were a bunch of little open questions. Um, we'd, op we'd implemented a version where uh, you were able to change the name on the sticky note and that didn't fe necessarily feel quite right. And we were trying to like figure out like, you know, should we let people edit their names on sticky notes? If, you know, someone else edits their name on a sticky note, should it persist on new sticky notes? Should the authorship change, et cetera, et cetera. Um, very like specific questions that all depended on each other and were really important to get right because, you know, we all know that like crediting people for their ideas is really, really um, important. Um, and we don't want necessarily somebody else to like take credit of somebody else's idea. Um, so basically here, this was a bunch of feedback that we collected internally from our Slack channel, as well as like from our um, external alpha members and putting them into sticky notes was helpful to just cluster them together and just see them all in the same place. Um, and then from there, uh, I was like, just trying to think through this and I'm like a very visual thinker. Um, so being able to like put this into this diagram quickly with connectors and sticky notes um, helps me just like map it out. Um, and I basically just took this diagram and I was like, hey team, um, I'm thinking through this interaction. Um, this is how I, I think things should work, um, but I you know, haven't made a, a decision on all these like different parts of the sticky tree. Um, and I just shared it into Slack. Um, and what happened that was like really nice and very organic uh, was that asynchronously, you can see like everyone started stamping their faces on just using the stamp tool um, and just like adding their face here um, to vote for, you know, the parts of the interactions that they agreed on or like disagreed on. Um, and then you can start to see all these like different notes and quotes um, that just happened, you know, organically. And, and while I wasn't in the file, um, and we actually started to like build some consensus here around like what we thought the right interactions were. Um, cause you can see everyone's faces are sort of in the same place. Um, and then, yeah, this all sort of happened organically. And we actually sort of resolved these interactions by, by seeing all these faces here. And we made decisions, um, without having a meeting or without having to like 
jump on a call or like write a document. Um, so I think seeing this really visually helped people um, see what all the decisions were that we needed to make and it helped us map it out and put our faces on it. Um, so those are all my examples for today. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to Kian, um, who I know also has um, another really great example to share with you guys. Um, yeah, thanks, Jenny. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Kian, nice to meet you all. I'm a product designer working on everything Figchat and related. Um, today, I'm excited to share with y'all about how I use FigJam to design the interaction of Cursor High Fives, a fun little feature that we showcased during this year's config that's going to be released soon. Uh, just a quick demo. High Fives currently works at you shake your cursor uh, to trigger a high five mode and I have my uh, um, event so you're gonna like uh, scroll, uh, wiggle horizontally, yeah. And guess how high five happens. And when you're not high fiving, um, it works as like a way to like wave to your um, fellow like collaborators and friends as well. So, yeah, so I, I think I'll, I'll give you a quick rundown of like why the reason we decided to build um, Cursor High Five is the desire for a more expressive way to interact with your collaborators. Cursor has always been apparent just by doing a quick Twitter search, you can find other creative ways people are simulating high-fiving each other. I think my favorite one here is by like Jonathan, literally having like two image of a hand, just like um, high-fiving each other. And we believe that you know building an explicit way for people to express themselves and celebrate teamwork will make the overall collaborative experience more delightful in FigJam. And moving on to you know starting from a blank state, I, I was like pretty intimidated by exactly how I should go about this project since there isn't much relevant examples that I can reference from compared to something like a mobile like checkout flow right i think the closest one i've seen is like fortnite they have like a similar high five interaction but that's in a context of a game and i've always been a visual heavy thinker as i learn better and think through problems more efficiently just by sketching ideas out and so without thinking too much i just started a simple diagram flow of like what happens when you high five someone in real life. Although it was unclear how useful this was at the time, but I think just having some, some of my thinking visualized on Thick Jam is enough to get the ball rolling for me. And you know, during this process, you know, I drew lots of insights and learnings from one of Apple's like WWDC 18 uh, talk, uh, talk called Designing Fluid Interfaces. In this talk, uh, the designers at Apple explained the technique used to create the fluid gesture interface of the, high, uh, the iPhone X, uh, 10 uh, swipe, swipe up to go home gesture. So they, they presented a mental model of like a linear interfaces where, you know, here in the gesture, the, the thoughts like uh, happens, the, the gesture happens after the thoughts. So for example, when you thought of going back to the home screen from your phone, you swipe up from the bottom and you have to wait to the entire interface to fully animate to stay uh, to the state you want. But how our human brain works is like, we are constantly thinking and changing our mind. So if you suddenly change your mind, you want to go to your previous app in multitasking mode and instead of the home screen, you have to wait for the whole animation to finish before you start the second gesture to go into multitasking. So this type of interface does not mold well into how our behavior works. And instead the designers at Apple kind of suggest that, you know, we should prioritize gestures that happens in parallel of with our thoughts instead of being linear as it works better. So the way that interface is always ready to be, you know, constantly redirected making the interface feel like an extension of yourself. And I use this mental model map to think through our high five interactions. So tackling the questions such as, how can a single gesture serve different actions in parallel with 
you know, the user's way of thinking. This gives me a rough idea of like what to aim for uh, when I move on to diagramming the specific flow of the cursor. You know, here in the diagram, I use uh, auto layout, uh, a component with auto layout I copy from Figma. So I fill in all the possible thoughts, uh, gestures, and action types I can think about when someone was to high five, for example. Like for example, uh, maybe there's a thought here where like, um, I just join this file and I want to wave. And possible type of gestures, for example, it can be like, like wiggle cursors or, and like the type of like execute action, maybe the action can be like uh, waving. So, so after kind of like have it have things like put into this this diagram, I I got a clear picture of what's going on, and then I set a goal of like using high five should be simple enough that people can spontaneously high five each other at a given moment, but will not get into people's way of uh, their everyday like core tasks because that would be super annoying when you're just trying to like work and high five just keep on being triggering out of nowhere. Um, so moving on to the cursor interaction flow diagramming stage where I've received feedback from designers, product managers, engineers, where we went through several iterations. Um, the, the first diagram does not like go in depth of the specific cursor gesture, but you know, sets the expectation that we should have a separate mode for high five. Uh, we call it hands up mode while you're in hands up mode. You can either high five someone else or do a separate gesture like waving, just like how you would in, in real life. Um, and the, the, the second iteration kind of went in detail of the specific gestures, the, the type of like opportunities we can do and the different type of like condition uh, each flow needs because uh, from this stage, I kind of understand that like by diagramming it out, I understand it's important to make sure it's very easy to get out hands out mode. Um, so we don't want the cursor to always be in the way of people's um, workflow. And after receiving feedback from the team, um, I kind of, it, it feels like it could be simplified more. So the main change here in the third interaction is um, by embedding the, the separated um, waving uh, functionality into the main behavior of the hands up modes and say so instead of having two different gestures for two separate like um, actions, we combine them into one. So for example, why, why I'm in hands up mode, I, and I just I move around the hand just acts like you're waving. Um, so by, uh, by simplifying this interaction flow, um, we hope this opens up a lot more spontaneous moments that feels natural to people just like when they're waving and high-fiving in real life. Uh, okay, cool, I got, I got the core flow of high-fives figured out, but one major part missing is how might the cursor gesture work? You know, this, this part is important because without the cursor gesture, high-fives, using high-five will not feel as natural and spontaneous as real life. For example, you if you can only enter high five mode from a keyboard shortcut, the experience will feel a bit robotic and detached. So since uh, cursor gesture is more of a novel interaction, I work closely with the lead engineer, uh, Willie, uh, to brainstorm possibilities and ideas of how we can detect uh, server uh, several um, cursor gestures. So Willie has been super helpful and in explaining the possibilities and technical constraints. So the fact that he could just jump into the FigGen file and make a visual representation of the cursor gesture um, uh, detection algorithm he was thinking about by using you know, shapes and connectors just, just helps us tighten our collaboration process. So for example, these meter diagrams here, Willie Drew represents the accumulated uh, value from the different cursor data points we can draw from, such as the velocity of the cursor, acceleration, um, 
whether if the cursor is moving in a circle or rapidly changing direction. So when this uh, accumulated uh, value here get past a certain point, um, cursor high five will, will trigger. And at the same time, me and Willie also jam on you know, the, pers the possible interaction nuance under the hood we might need to take into account during high-fiving. Things such as the hands icons hit detection radius. And in the case of you know, the, the cursor moving at a high speed, we should increase the hit detection radius to make sure uh, both cursor is easier to hit each other. So the ability to quickly make visual representations during shapes, uh, using shapes on top of existing, my existing designs that I copy and pasted, such as the, the hand icon here from Figma, uh, really makes the collaboration experience between like cross-functional cross partners much more easier. And so where, where we landed on here is, you know, in, the, in the end, we end up with uh, a single gesture that serves different actions in parallel with the user's wave of thinking that is already this, that is always ready for redirection. So, for example, a single gesture can enter hands up mode, high five other cursors, and and wave at the same time. Clicking anytime, clicking anywhere, or clicking on any tool will exit you out on, from the high five mode. So it doesn't hinder you from your you know daily uh, workflow. So for, for closing thoughts, although what we have here isn't the final, final perfect state, as we went through many, many more iteration on during pro the prototyping stage, but FigJam has played a huge role in you know, making me feel comfortable um, to get started in a blank state through visualizing my ideas, um, making design process more accessible just by you know, helping me bring more people into the earlier process to tackle the riskiest uh, interaction. And lastly, tighten the collaboration loop by encouraging product partners like engineers to create diagrams in real time alongside with me to think through like the nitty gritty details like um, the cursor gesture, the detection. So final thoughts is like, here are some of our team's uh, first reaction when we first try high fives. And I can't wait for y'all to try it out. Uh, thank you for taking your time, and ho I hope you know, y'all are able to take away that something useful um, from here. Uh, up next, we're going to have like Noah. Uh, awesome. Thank you, Kian. Um, that was just so inspiring. I mean, I feel like uh, getting to see Kian and Jenny design Fig Jam like this and the amount of thought and detail they put into each kind of choice is just like still constantly inspires me. And uh, I really enjoyed watching that. So this is gonna be a little bit of a different lens. Um, so my role at Figma um, as design director kind of involves a lot of different things. And these are probably the main kind of six things that I would spend most of my time on. So definitely some stuff with hiring, culture, coaching, process, product, and community. And Honestly, within each of these, we're finding ourselves using Figma quite often. And I'm not going to go through all of these examples today. Unfortunately, we don't have time for that. Uh, I starred some of the ones that we are going to look at. Um, but just to kind of breeze through them for a bit, in hiring, we're doing it all from beginning to end, from like identifying what it is that we're looking for with sticky notes together and kind of aligning on those things to a hiring kit, which I'm going to show you in more detail, uh, to even just outlining our hiring process. And with things like culture, we're finding ourselves anything from like helping onboard new employees with like our org chart, or recently we're opening a San Francisco office soon and kind of working through uh, the room names for that even, as well as um, looking through like feedback. We do a culture survey every quarter and kind of digesting it visually by taking all these screenshots from the report and annotating them and thinking together as a team about what we want to improve. Um, and even some lightweight things like games. In coaching, we're finding ourselves using it from anything from feedback and discussion, but also we started coming up with this idea of this new hire intake survey. So about a week before someone joins, we ask them a bunch of questions about what they're looking for and what they're hoping to learn. And we hope that this becomes an interesting way to get to know each other early on and have a place to come back to, to remember those things. Uh, inside a process, we are doing anything from kind of like planning offsites, which we'll look at in more detail in a second, uh, to understanding as a team, like retrospectives and how we wanna do feedback and, and approvals, things like that. 
Um, in product, uh, we're doing a lot of critiques uh, in FigJam, and we'll show you a little bit more about that in a second. Um, sometimes diving into data a little bit and being able to ask questions together and just having this visual canvas for that kind of thing. Um, even just thinking about FigJam itself, uh, again, pretty meta, you're seeing a lot of that today, but like how its adoption might look over time. And then finally, under community, Anything from we have a press kit in FigJam, which is kind of fun, to anytime we're doing conferences or events like this one, we're using FigJam to plan it, as well as even just gathering external feedback. So the three that I'm going to show you today, uh, I'm going to start with the hiring kit. The hiring kit is something we came up with when realizing that people often have a lot of interesting and similar questions when you're getting to know each other when interviewing for a role. And so we don't necessarily show all of this content at once when talking with a candidate. You really wanna choose the right time to bring something like this in, and even then select the moments that they might be most interested in. But for example, we'll use this space as a shared visual canvas to talk about like what it is they're looking for, questions they have about the company, maybe their timeline, and even some next steps. We'll show our org chart if that's helpful for people to get to know our team and really put some faces to the names behind features. Um, we might talk about our career ladder, our schedule, and all kinds of content like this, even stuff like our strategy. And, and then we have this big open area to talk about like the role itself. And so we'll put screenshots maybe of the types of problems they'd be working on. And I just find that having that visual space to talk about roles can be so illuminating for candidates to understand what they what it might look like. Um, even things like our collaboration with Engine PM and what that can look like, or our time zones with our remote employees, um, our values as a team. And so just even having these pieces like Lego blocks ready to go, anytime someone has a question about them, we can just kind of pop them into the shared canvas together and use it. And so I find this to be super helpful um, when kind of just making sure that we're doing the best we can to offer the clearest picture of what it might look like to work at Figma. The next example uh, is um, critiques. And so if those of you who attended config uh, this past spring and summer, we wa we walked through like an actual live critique uh, in front of everyone. There's a recording of it if you're interested in our community. Um, and this was something that we did, um, we do often for, for different stages of the design process. We do use different tools for critique, including Figma, of course, itself, um, sometimes Dropbox paper. And for FigJam, we often find ourselves using it for earlier stage ideas, things that are more maybe generative, um, maybe some retrospectives. And then for like the fit and finish part of the process, sometimes we're going over to Figma. Um, and so kind of fluidly going between them as needed for the project. And so this particular example was one that we used for onboarding of FigJam itself. And we usually provide some context by pasting in a bunch of the kind of different frames inside um, from Figma. And then basically giving, showing people even a place to look at like uh, research in the file and kind of just giving people a way to respond to the different ideas they're seeing um, using things like reactions and um, stamps and so on to kind of engage, like add more context to that conversation. Um, and so this is, yeah, it's, it's not something we do all the time for all critiques, but it's something that we often find helpful um, when we are looking for like that kind of broader range of feedback. Um, the third example that I wanted to share uh, is offsite planning. This is something we do offsites about once a quarter um, and of different sort of varying levels of size. So maybe some smaller ones and a bigger one. And at first we were using paper to kind of do this kind of planning. And one of the things we noticed was that when you have like a linear kind of brainstorm doc, there's all kinds of little detailed challenges that start to come up. For example, if someone's editing at the top, the whole kind of document starts to move downward. And it's hard to have like everyone looking at the same thing at the same time. And it's hard to have multiple threads of conversations going in different ways. And so at a point realized it's actually easier to kind of paste a lot of this stuff uh, into FigJam so you can broaden the conversation and have lots of different focus areas to look at. This also allows you to do little exercises like spectrums, which we find ourselves doing quite a bit for like, you know, what kinds of activities are we looking to do for this offsite? Do we want to have um, homework for it or is it kind of isolated in its own? Um, what are the unique moments about our team at this stage in time? And what is some inspiration that we can take um, in, when talking about that? Um, and so this became kind of a, a richer way to plan moments like this um, and to, to realize like what it is that we want to do. In fact, we could paste um, a calendar in and kind of think about what dates this would happen in and things to think about there. Um, you know, just really just planning every detail out and all the way to the end, which is where you really kind of finally have your more detailed plan um, that you can place to kind of start to also communicating with the team about what it is. And so we really enjoy using FigJam, again, for kind of all different kinds of moments from offsites planning when it comes to like kind of process, um, from critiques when it comes to product, um, from hiring both in talking to candidates, but also internally planning and so on. And so 
Um, I wish I had more time to show you all these different things, but we, we really wanted to make sure that we carved out plenty of time to answer questions that people have. Um, and so I'm gonna move back over and hand it over to uh, Anna who will help us manage the questions that are coming in. Uh, yeah, so if you guys have any other questions you wanted us to answer, please type them into the Q&A and we can add it to here. But right now, yeah, we're gonna go through a couple that people have already asked about. Um, so let's talk about the one with, how has FigJam changed the way that the design team works with each other and with others? Uh, Kian, would you like to answer that question? Because you talked a bit about collaboration. Uh, yeah, for sure. I think um, how Fiction changed the design team work uh, with each other and others is that, you know, just like from my example of like just help, like even helping me where, you know, the engineers when they want to like, describe a more like technical um, aspect of the implementation constraints, for example, and just like by just being able to like easily visualize things through using like shapes and, and sticky or, or connectors really helps me understand like what exactly it's possible versus not. And within our design team, uh, we also work with using, uh, using FigGen for like um, conducting like design crits. And we also tend to like send our design crit files to, to, to engineers and uh, let them like comment or, or leave sticky notes in there as well. Yeah, maybe just to add a little bit to that too. Like, I think a lot of times when people saw Figma files, which we were using for a lot of these use cases before we had designed FigJam, I think a lot of people sometimes felt a little intimidated. You've got this layer panel on the left-hand side. It's got a lot of different detail to it. And if you've never used a design tool, it can feel like a, maybe a, a lot at once. And so I think introducing FigJam to our process definitely added a lot more interest in, in our cross-functional partners and feeling safe and comfortable to participate by not being kind of held back by a lot of the conventions that those of us using design tools for 10 or 20 years like you know have known and so i think it's been a really nice way to just open up the process and i think even across the company in our different slack channels we're noticing people use it a lot more than i think we saw people using figma for example and so we're hoping that like by it being a more inviting and welcoming interface um we're seeing just like more people collaborate every day all right great um we have another question where they're asking about what are the different ways to organize figma and fig jam files does anyone want to take that to answer it um yeah there there could be i mean i'd be curious to know more about like sort of what um what use cases people had in mind when thinking about how to organize them and if they're talking about maybe like the file browser and how to structure them in projects versus organizing them in the file i'll maybe assume that it's talking about in the file which has been more the focus of, of some of this conversation i think there's not one convention that we're seeing everyone always use across the board there are a, a lot of wonderful templates in the community that people use to kind of give you a starting point so that you can kind of avoid like the blank page problem or like not being sure how to structure something. Um, and so I think just like, you know, we're often even just like in this file using kind of subheadings or headings or titles to kind of organize content and information in meaningful ways. Um, you know, sometimes we'll draw a little like dividers, you can hold shift, for example, to draw like a straight line, um, if you wanted to, you know, to organize content that way. And then in Figma, of course, you have sort of added layers of structure, you've got things like pages and other kinds of moments to organize information. And so that adds more detail and people do all kinds of interesting things um, to kind of like orient people in a file that way. Um, we, you know, I think with having a simple flat canvas with FigJam, I think people often do what they might do with pages in Figma, but kind of laid out maybe more visually or structurally. Great. All right. So um, let's move on to this other question where they're talking about um, Jenny, maybe you could talk more about how we can use components in FigJam for different use cases. Yeah. Um, so the use case that I showed was specifically just for brainstorming. Um, I've also seen other people create different um, templates for brainstorming too, where it's like a sort of like title card um, and has like the a little area for sketching. Um, it's good for exercises like crazy eights where you have like the different, um, you can lay out like eight different boxes and have people just sketch within that. Um, have also seen um, things like uh, 
I think I've seen the design team actually use like a pretty consistent one for brainstorms where it's like sort of a title card um, and then an area for you to like put all your sticky notes on. Um, other things are like, I think with the text editing um, ability. So like if you bring over a component from Figma design, you can edit the text of it. Um, you can edit, you can create components with like auto layout and have those actually like format really well. Um, there's also a few components within like the library panel too that we have um, that are actually components under the hood and you can like edit the text here. So like this little hamburger one that I just dragged in, you can like write text here and it'll reflow and like, you know, it's a hamburger. Um, but these are all just, um, these are all just different components that are created in Figma design. Um, so you can create these components yourself too um, and have them work here. Great, thank you for sharing that. Um, all right, let's see some other questions. Uh, someone asked about if we'll have the templates available. So uh, we will be sharing some of the um, examples that we shared during the live stream today. And we'll send that along with the video once that is ready. Um, okay, another question was asking about, will we have any voting system available in FigJam? And then someone is also asking about any kinds of shape detection for helping create diagrams and wireframes. Yeah, we're um, we're definitely thinking a lot about all these different use cases uh, and and um, you know no no timelines or things that we can you know talk about or promise here. Um, I think we're always kind of just thinking about like what are the core needs that people have when they're in use cases like brainstorming or retrospectives, whatever they might be. And even within that, what are the needs that like a facilitator or a host of a of some kind of jam session might have versus um, you know, a participant who's new to it. And so I think we're looking at all those different use cases and constantly trying to wrestle and prioritize with all these different possible things we could build. Um, I think, you know, following a somewhat similar process with Figma too, where there's almost an infinite list of things you could build at any given time. And it's always like probably the hardest problem companies face is like, how do we pick which one? Like, absolutely, it would be great to like detect drawing and, and automatically sort of create the right shape based on what you're drawing. It would it would definitely make a lot of sense to do a lot of things like voting. And so these are things that we're all very interested in. But yet, of course, we have to juggle, you know, what what's the right sequence of, of those needs. Um, and we definitely take um, customer feedback like this as one of the most important signals uh, that we have to help with that. And so the more that you let us know what you're noticing and what you need, the more that helps us figure out um, that kind of priority order. Thank you so much. Um, we have time for a couple more questions. Someone just asked one about where does the FigJam file live once you're done with the brainstorm? Um, where do you keep all the information? Is it a summary doc? Do you guys have any suggestions for that? Um, for us, it just like usually lives in the same project folder as the rest of our design files. Um, and we basically just, can we basically have that as like a living artifact of the brainstorm and we'll go back and refer to it. Um, but sometimes if there's like ideas from the brainstorm that are really good, we'll actually like take those sticky notes or take those sketches and bring those into our design files and have those like referenced as we're basically um, fleshing those out to like higher fidelity ideas. Um, so since like, you know, since you can copy and paste back and forth, um, we'll do that um, once we like decide to move on with some ideas. Great, thanks. And we've had a couple of questions sort of echoing the same theme, but people were wondering if we could share a bit more about how you would onboard someone who's not a designer onto FigJam, um, if they're maybe initially like new to the tool or uncomfortable with using new tools. Yeah, I think that's a, a really great question and we're you know, there's a combination of like in-product solutions that we can always be thinking about and coming up with to onboard new users. You know, there's a, a wide spectrum of new people, right? They maybe they've never used any digital whiteboarding tool. Maybe they've never used, and in those moments, like maybe they, you know, basic things like panning and zooming might be hard. There might be people who have some familiarity with it, some that have used Figma a lot. And so definitely like with anything, if you are the kind of host or facilitator in a brainstorm with your cross-functional partners, it's really good to like ask a bunch of questions to them ahead of time, just to get to know their familiarity with things and sort of start to like onboard them um, as you go. And so sometimes we'll do things like, you know, include little screenshots 
um, of like the UI in the beginning of the file that'll sort of point to like, hey, here's probably what you want to do right now, especially if the activity is mostly using sticky notes, then maybe we would lean into that further. Or if the activity um, is mostly about like maybe using reactions, then that's probably the first thing we'll mention. Um, one example of a pattern I've seen us use often is actually using cursor chat to teach people those things. So we might say like, you know, type slash to do this and then people start following it, right? Or maybe we're saying like, you know, type E or shift E to like open up the little like, you know, reactions wheel. Um, so I think those are like other things I've noticed us do. I don't know, Jenny and Kian, are, are there other kind of moments you've seen us kind of use to kind of onboard or educate? Um, we also have like, when you first uh, sign up for a fig jam, there's like a getting started file um, that gets like basically automatically created. And that one has like, it's, it's basically a step-by-step -step on how to use a lot of the um, functions within FigJam and it's a FigJam file. Um, so you can actually like start marking it up and stuff like that. Um, that one is a good one to walk through with anybody who's new. Um, yeah. 